Today, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin, faced the nation with correspondents across the country questioning him. Live from Indianapolis, New York City, and also here in Washington, here's the moderator of Face the Nation, Ted Koop. How do you do? And welcome to Face the Nation. Senator McCarthy, on the eve of this historic special session of the United States Senate, called to debate a motion to censor you, millions of Americans are wondering what it's all about. To direct their questions to you, our panel of newsmen is now assembled nearly halfway across the continent. Here in Washington are William H. Lawrence of the New York Times and William Hines, Jr. of the Washington Star. Standing by nearly 800 miles away in Indianapolis is Jeff Cadu, Indiana manager of International News Service with a question of interest in the Midwest. Come in, Jeff Cadu. Cadu. Senator McCarthy, several weeks ago, you predicted that the United States Senate would censor you, and several days ago, Roy Kuhn told us in Indianapolis that the cards were stacked against you. Uh, how do you feel about that now, and uh, uh, if you feel the same way, uh, why, Senator? Now, from New York, Frank Gibney of Newsweek magazine has a question of interest on the eastern seaboard. Come in, Frank Gibney. Senator, do you think it was Eastern liberal Republicans rather than the Democrats who got you in hot water? Well, Senator, there are the first two questions. Mr. Cadu in Indianapolis wants to know if you still feel the cards are stacked against you and why. I think that uh, the opposition has enough votes to censure. The Democrats, I believe, will go pretty much down the line on this. Then the so-called liberal, I put liberal in quote, Republicans will go along with them. I think they've got plenty of votes to uh, do it. In fact, I was talking to one of my Democrat friends the other day. He told me very frankly he was going to vote for censure. He said, not because of the silly reasons given by the Wat Watkins Committee. He said, but because you label the Democrat Party as the party of communism. I explained to him that I felt that there were millions, I've long said, good, loyal, Americans in the Democrat Party, but apparently that doesn't have any effect. Well, do you feel, in regard to Mr. Gibney's question, that the liberal Republicans are at the basis of this move? Uh, well, uh, Flanders is one of the men who introduced a resolution. He calls himself a liberal. Wayne Morris, another. Uh, both uh, one a Republican, one an independent. Then uh, Fulbright, the third, who's a Democrat. Um, it's hard to tell who's at the basis of it. It's the, I wouldn't be up for censure. This is the fifth investigation of McCarthy. They wouldn't be conducting this fifth investigation if I had not been fighting communists. Well, Senator, on August 5th, when the Watkins Censure Committee was uh, announced, you said in a television interview these words, I'm fully satisfied with the committee. They seem to be good, honest senators. Now, you're not saying that any longer. I'd like to know what caused you to change your mind. Well, at the time that I made that statement, I had only objected to one of the senators, Senator Irvin. I objected to his being appointed. I said I thought that he would be prejudiced. He was on my government operations committee, so I knew something about him. Uh, however, I didn't know that uh, uh, Senator Johnson, for whom, incidentally, I had held quite a bit of respect, that he had said in a, an interview that all the Democrat leaders, that would mean himself, loathed McCarthy, and that he felt that no more than six Republicans uh, had anything less than disgust for McCarthy. All right, well, then I, you... I, I, I may say that I, I don't think there's any American, nor you, uh, Bill, who'd like to be tried by a six-man jury where one man says he loathes you, the other man, uh, uh, Irvin, I didn't know this at the time the committee was appointed, According to the, your paper bill, the New York Times, uh, Irvin said that if uh, they challenged me, I could be disqualified. He gives the reason. He said, I've written many letters deploring the activities of McCarthy. Well, now, you've said that you did I, I don't know like that, that I don't like to take too much time it. answering, but I'd, I'd like to take the third man on the committee, the chairman. All right. The chairman, during the Munt hearings, left the room. I didn't know that at the time he was appointed either, and he should have told the Senate, of course. 
He left the room as he was leaving. I was coming in. I shook hands with him, as you'd normally do with a senator you hadn't seen for a couple of months. He rushed out in a, almost in a lather and met Constantine Brown, whom you all know. He's the correspondent for your paper. And told Connie Brown that he was very much disturbed. He hoped that the newspaper, the news, the cameras, rather, and the uh, television would not see him shaking hands with me. He said if they did, he could never explain that to his paper. So there you have three of the six-man jury, two of them saying we loathe him, I, we could be disqualified. The third saying, I can't do anything favorable or I couldn't explain to the liberal press. All right, well, that's three of them. But the fact is that this committee handed down a unanimous ruling. I'd like to ask you about the other three individually. Do you think the case of South Dakota was biased against you? I don't think I would care to discuss the uh, other three at this time. Well, I think that it's a, part of the, it's a part of the story. The committee is biased, you say. The committee, three members of the committee are biased. The committee put, down, put out a a uh, unanimous report. Mm -hmm. Why are you unwilling to talk about Case, or, or Stennis, and Carlson? Or let's talk about them, then, if you would right, like. I think, I think maybe you're right that you make a good point there, Bill, that they should be discussed. Rather than discussing them and telling you what I think about them, let's take the report. In the report, you find they say McCarthy, and I quote from page 29, should be censured because there is no justification in this record for the harsh criticism directed by him toward the Gillette Committee. All right, but that's in the report. That's in the report. This is very important, it? and they all signed this. Now, the ruling, in other words, here they say McCarthy should be censured because his criticism of the Gillette Committee was not justified. He didn't show any justification. Now, if you go to page 296 of the record, you find that Watkins, in a fit of childish anger, banged his gavel and said they weren't interested in any evidence. Well, let's leave justice. the okay, adjectives no, let me out my, let me for a minute, my answer. Joe. Let me finish my answer. Uh, uh, and ba banged his gavel and says, and I, I quote him verbatim, he says, the only matter this committee is interested in is whether a resolution had been in introduced authorizing the Gillette investigation, and second, was it being carried on and did it have jurisdiction? So you find the six senators signing a report saying McCarthy should be censured because he didn't show justification for his criticism of the dishonest Gillette Committee, and then you find them upholding the chairman in a ruling in which he says you can't show justification. But bias is something that exists before the fact. You're talking now about the report that was put out after the investigation. What I am asking you very specifically is, do you think that Case, Stennis, and Carlson, or any of them, was biased before the committee started its deliberations? I don't know. Now a question from New York. Senator, perhaps you'd like to name a six senators who you think might uh, have uh, given a fairer view, in your opinion, of uh, the censure motion. No, I don't think I would name the senators, but if you had six who were biased against me, I'm going to strike that. If you had three who were prejudice, prejudiced against me, then the fair thing would have been to have found three who were in my favor. Uh, that still wouldn't be in accordance with American rules of uh, justice, the, even in a justice court. The elementary rule is that every one of the six jurors, that's the lowest court we have, every one of the six jurors must be unprejudiced. Now, Arthur Watkins, the chairman, went on the air and uh, said that he didn't think it was necessary for them to be unprejudiced. He said it is, it is all right. I think he used the word impartial, not unprejudiced. He used I, the I word think, senators and not jurors, didn't he? There is well, a difference between a juror and a senator, isn't no, these, there? No, these, these, these men were acting as jurors. He used the word senator in that quote. You have misquoted him on five no, or six occasions no, I have about not that, him. Joe. Now, just, just a minute. He's, he, he said that those six jurors... He said those just, six just senators. Minute, Bill, uh, let me finish. All right. The six senators were acting as the judges as, and the jury. He said it was unnecessary that they be unprejudiced, unnecessary that they be impartial. That's the most fantastic statement I ever heard from a chairman of a committee. What he said now, they, they, were, they were the jurors. They were the judge and the jury. I don't care what term he applied. But aren't it was you a taking it out of jury. context? Wasn't he saying basically that a senator doesn't come to Washington unbiased? Uh, a senator comes to Washington having taken points. Wasn't that what he was saying? No. No, that was not what he was saying. In, in the report, they say, I had preconceived notions about General Zwicker. In Watkins' statement, uh, in, the in the report, 
He says it made no difference whether or not the jury, by the jury I mean those six senators, well, they had preconceived notions. Now, I, I, I just ask any American who's listening to this show whether they would like to sit before a six-man jury uh, and have three of them prejudiced against you to begin with. One of them who says, I'm afraid to do anything favorable for fear of what the press might do to me. Uh, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, tie in with American uh, uh, jurisprudence. But isn't this thing in the nature of an indictment rather than of, a, than of a jury verdict? The jury comes up tomorrow, doesn't it? The 96 men on, in the Senate are the jurors, aren't they? These, these, you had a six-man jury. They said originally they would just find facts. They changed that during the rule during the middle of the game, of course. Senator, to I don't think you and Mr. Hines are likely to agree about I don't the think makeup so. of the committee. Uh, to go to the heart of one of the uh, of the charges, which is that you failed to appear before the Gillette Committee, uh, some of your supporters have argued that. Uh, in your defense, that they didn't perfect their record and that since they simply invited you to testify and never took the step of subpoenaing you, uh, that this is, uh, that they have no right to censor you on that grounds. Well, num number one, uh, uh, Mr. Lawrence, they did not invite me to testify and the letters are all on the record. Gillette wrote a number of times and said, you can appear if you desire to appear, if you want to appear. Uh, the only invitation was extended when I was up in the Northwoods uh, sent to my office after uh, Mr. Cotter, the chief counsel, knew that I would not be there to receive it. He set a deadline uh, three days after the letter was sent, knowing I could not come back from uh, Land O'Lakes, Wisconsin, in that three days that I would not get the well, invitation. What about so there was, there was no invitation until about 17 months after the investigation was going, and then the invitation said, the deadline is the 25th of December. It is sent the 21st. One of the days was Sunday. They, what, about they, they the point, impossible. what about the point that they should have subpoenaed you as a legal defense on that? They have said in their report that they could have subpoenaed me if they wanted to. Uh, apparently, for some reason, they did not want me before that committee. Well, now, Senator, I... Uh, Mr. Lawrence, very uh, point, I, I, if I may pursue it, uh, Senator, I hold in my hand, which is one of your favorite <laughs> expressions, that... Uh, uh, your testimony before the Army McCarthy hearings on June 11th, uh, page 2603, in which you say that, uh, I would like to make it clear that my appearing on the stand should be no precedent in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years for forcing senators to appear. I want it clear that I appear here upon my own volition. If I had been subpoenaed, frankly, I would not have, have appeared. I think that under the Constitution, you cannot force senators to testify and so forth. I wonder if that isn't kind of at a variance with the defense now that uh, the record isn't clear because they didn't subpoena you by the other committee. No, in, in line with that, Mr. Lawrence, uh, I tried to give the Watkins Committee the right to subpoena senators on the Senate floor. Senator Hayden, who is the ranking member of the Gillette Committee, uh, refused to allow us to give a Senate committee the right to subpoena senators. Now, uh, you can subpoena a senator when the Senate is not in session. You cannot subpoena him while the Senate is in session. But the testimony is replete with evidence that I told Gillette time and time again that if they would order me to appear or subpoena me, that I would honor that order or that subpoena. I told him that I felt that it was a dishonest committee, completely dishonest, and that I had no desire to appear before them. That, that answer still stands. Now we have a question from Jeff Cadu in Indianapolis. Mr. McCarthy, the Republicans uh, uh, ignored the anti-communist issue for a long time during the campaign, and then they finally came to it in the closing days of the campaign. Do you think that uh, if they'd started earlier on the anti-communist issue, they might still have control of both houses or one house of uh, Congress? Yes, I, I think uh, that uh, if the Republicans would have discussed in detail the extent to which the Democrat administration had been infiltrated by communists, that we perhaps would have control of both houses. I think that Dick Nixon in the last two weeks did a very good job of discussing that issue. I was rather surprised to find uh, 
our good president and avoiding it uh, to a great extent. I believe he did use the word communism one or two times during his speeches. A question from Frank Gibney in New York. Senator McCarthy, uh, um, a gentleman named Case did pretty well in Jersey, uh, though by your standards uh, and the standards of other, uh, quotation marks, anti-communist, I suppose you'd call him a quotation mark uh, liberal. What would you have Chief. to say about that? Uh, number one, uh, Mr. Gibney, I think you've made uh, a mistake in your checking of the election returns. Mr. Case ran uh, way behind, uh, way behind the Republican ticket, just hopelessly behind the Republican ticket. Senator, uh, this might be of interest to Jeff Cadu out in Indianapolis. You've criticized some senators for not having an open mind, so to speak, on having made up their minds in advance to vote against you tomorrow or when the, when the vote comes up on censure. Now, five weeks ago on this network, Senator Capehart of Indiana said that he was prepared to vote for you. Don't you think that that's equally reprehensible? No, I don't think that is reprehensible. Well, does that represent an open mind? If he's already no, decided to vote for it, you? It indicates that he's gone over the facts and decided that the, there's no grounds for censure. Well, censure. wouldn't you give the other senators who would vote on the other side the same credit for going over the facts oh. and making up their minds in advance? Well, Mr. Hines, I'm talking about uh, senators who made up their minds. I'm talking about the type of senator whom I talked to who said, I will vote against you because you've labeled my party as the uh, party of communism. Uh, in other words, they're not voting on the basis of these silly recommendations the Watkins Committee made, but because I feel that I hurt their party. Incidentally, in connection with the Watkins Committee, you just spoke pretty highly a moment or so ago about Vice President Nixon. Now, he was the man who appointed the Watkins Committee. Don't you think he knew what he was doing when he appointed it? I think that the three men who were prejudiced, who had expressed prejudice against me, owed a duty to the Vice President, a duty to the Senate, to tell him that they did not have open minds. I think Senator Johnson of Colorado should have said, I have already said I loathe McCarthy. I think that Senator Irvin should have told the Vice President that he felt he was not qualified to sit, as he had previously said. I think Senator Watkins should have told the Vice President that he was ashamed to be seen shaking hands with McCarthy for fear of what his newspapers would say. If they had done that, the Vice President would not have appointed those men uh, he was in the dark on that. Frank Gibney has another question in New York. Senator, these uh, comments of yours lead me to assume that a uh, qualified impartial senator might be a, uh, a man who's made up his mind for you and that a uh, base uh, meretricious fellow uh, might be a fellow who's, uh, mm -hmm. who you think might have made up his mind against you. Uh, I, I wouldn't subscribe to that. Uh, you see, in American justice, we try to get jurors who have not made up their mind one way or the other. I'm sure we could have gotten uh, six senators if the senators were frank in telling whether they had prejudice or not. Do you think that uh, there are six men in the Senate who haven't got some opinion on Joe McCarthy, good, bad, or indifferent? I, uh, if I may answer this way, Mr. Hines, I think you could have gotten six senators who would have, who would not have said they were against me beforehand or for me beforehand. I think we could have gotten six fair senators. Mr. Senator, Lawrence? what's the uh, outlook now for your, the work of your committee? Uh, come January, you, uh, you go out as chairman, apparently, on the basis of the election returns as we read them now. I'm well, wondering if you recall that during the Army McCarthy hearings, you said that there were certain documents in the committee files that you wouldn't show the Democrats. Are you taking those out of the files now, or what happens to the committee files? Bill, I wouldn't strip a file, you know that. Well, now, I just <laughs> wanted to raise the question, Joe, because you had said that you would the, not turn the, these documents the over no, to no, the Nothing will be turned over to uh, uh, the Democrats, which would give the names of my informants. I've well, got a duty not to turn over that. Well, by, what right do you, by what right do you remove things from, by, from by the this, committee? By this file? right, uh, Mr. Lawrence, when a man comes to me and says, can I talk to you in confidence? Can I give you evidence of wrongdoing, corruption, graft, and confidence? I say, yes, you can give it to me in confidence. That is in confidence. Senator uh, McClellan said that he indicated he would not respect that confidence. Therefore, I, I must not give the, any information which will give the names of informants. Then you are taking things out of the files. Mm, I don't think we've taken any other files. I've carried most of that information in my mind. My file is pretty much up here. Now, uh, 
carrying it a step further, you issued an open invitation during the Army McCarthy hearings for people to continue to supply you with information. That's right. Regardless of its stamping. Are you getting uh, new information from people in this administration Bill, on let that me, basis? Let me change your question a bit. I invited them to give information of wrongdoing, graft, corruption, communism. I am continuing to get uh, that information. Getting documents, too? Yes. Are mm -hmm. you getting any more as a result of your appeals than you got beforehand? Mm, has there been a flow build up as a result of that? It's pretty hard to say whether it has increased or decreased. I've been so busy being investigated and preparing for this uh, uh, lynch bee starting tomorrow that I haven't had to, uh, an opportunity to... You call That's a meeting of the United States Senate a lynch bee? Well, let's, call it, let's call it the uh, censure... Uh, uh, no, but I'm interested meeting. in this because the Senate's an institution of government. It's part of the Congress. Well, you okay, let's, let's answer it, Bill. Let, let, let's answer it, Bill. Let's do. The, the, there are a great number of the Democrats who have indicated uh, in private conversations that they will censure McCarthy, not because of what is in the Watkins report, because of uh, I've labeled them as the party of communism, even though I have always pointed out that there are millions of Democrats who are good, loyal Americans and many office holders here in Washington who are anti-communist. But there are those who feel that they should censure me, not for, not because I cross-examined Zwicker trying to find out a, about a communist whom he promoted, honorably discharged. There, there are some Republicans who feel likewise. Now, I, I consider that, uh, yes, that's, that's a lynching bee. Well, this is an orderly when, 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 assembly. When they're, when they're not, when they're not, when they're not uh, basing their vote upon the... Uh, uh, counts set forth when they base their vote upon political reasons when they say ahead of time. In effect, regardless of what the evidence says, this man has been fighting communism. He's been showing that over 20 years the Democrat Party has been infiltrated. Therefore, we're going to get him. Well, now, Senator... I, th I think a lynching bee is a good name for it, Bill. Senator, the Republican leadership of the Senate will support this motion of censor as well. Now, are they doing it because no, you're, you're, making, you're, you're making a pretty, pretty uh, uh, rash statement? Well, I, I have no hesitancy about making it, but uh, well, to I, continue I with the point. I disagree with you. I don't think they will. You don't think they will? You don't no. think Nolan will vote to censor you? you I'm don't not going to name any. I don't think the Republican leadership is going to uh, go along with this. I hope not. It was their committee, half of it. It's a leadership committee. Uh, I, you, you said the Republican leadership would go along with this. I disagree. I don't think they will. Well, do I've, I've received no commitments from uh, any Republican. Strike that. I haven't re I've received no, no commitments from any Republican leader on this, but I uh, don't expect they'll go along with this. Now, Jeff Cadu has a question in Indianapolis. Senator, is there a powerful Republican leader outside Congress who's been responsible for most of your troubles? And if so, uh, would you tell us who he is? Uh, number one, I don't think I have troubles, uh, but answering your question, uh, I wouldn't want to name any one individual. I, I know this, that this is the fifth investigation of McCarthy. I will continue to investigate communists. There will be a sixth, the seventh, and eighth as long as I am in the Senate. Now to Frank Gibney in New York. Senator, it's been widely said that uh, uh, you feel there's a man named Dewey around New York with a certain cell of uh, uh, Republicans, uh, like the aforementioned Senator Case, uh, who've been uh, masterminding uh, mm. this move to mm. get you. Uh, mm. I'd just like to take up no. Mr. Cadu's line of questioning there. Uh, do you still, uh, do you think this is true, or did you ever? I have, I have never made any statement to that effect. I like Tom Dewey. I would be very surprised to find that Tom Dewey was masterminding this uh, Get McCarthy deal. Well, could, during could, the could I, Mr. Hines, an answer to a question which I think I didn't fully answer before. Could I point out to you the sort of thing that I condemn in the Watkins Committee? Can we, we make find, it off we find, uh, Just take 30 seconds. Find on page 296 of the report. And this is fantastic. You wouldn't believe it, but it's all in writing. We were trying to show that uh, the old Gillette Committee were sub uh, was subpoenaing a man whom they knew to be mentally incompetent to smear me. They knew his charges were unfounded. And uh, Senator Watkins, in a fit of childish anger, beat the table with his gavel, and here's what he said. Listen to this. But tell me this, Joe. Just one sentence. This is one sentence. 
He says, but I do not think whether or not even an investigator was incompetent, whether he was insane or not insane has anything to do with this investigation. In other words, we find the chairman, he was upheld by the committee, page 296 saying that even if the investigators for the Gillette committee were insane, and we knew of no such situation, that I could not criticize the Gillette committee. It's this theory that for some reason or other, members of, of a committee are above reproach, are abo above criticism. Skipping all I the don't agree with that. Skipping all the technicalities about the Gillette committee, uh, Senator, which may be important one way or the other, do you have any plans to give the Senate a financial accounting such as the Gillette committee was asking? If, if there's any evidence of any wrongdoing on my part, I certainly will answer it. Well, you remember if, the... If the, there, there has been no evidence of any wrongdoing... You remember the committee, series... Let, let me answer this. A committee examined my finances for 18 months. They could find no evidence of wrongdoing. Now, if you're going to have a rule that all senators uh, give a complete financial accounting to the Senate, that was suggested by one senator, I wouldn't object to that, but there will be no rule. There'll be no rule, Bill, that applies only to McCarthy. Nixon and uh, Stevenson uh, unless, did it. Unless they, unless they find some evidence of wrongdoing. Nixon and Stevenson did it. Why can't you? Just Steve as a Stevenson matter of information not to, to the public. Stevenson did not do it. Why, after, uh, after the Nixon speech, he went on the air and did it, didn't he? No. Maybe not to your satisfaction. No, he, he, he didn't disclose uh, all of his finance, finances. I'm afraid, uh, gentlemen, that is all the time we have. Thank you very much, Senator McCarthy, for facing the nation and for answering the questions being asked today from representative sections of these widespread United States. Our correspondents asking the questions were from Indianapolis, Jep Kadu, Indiana manager for International News Service. And representing the Eastern Seaboard from New York City, Frank Gibney of, New York, of Newsweek magazine. We also want to thank our Washington correspondents Backstopping the questions from across the country to Senator McCarthy or William H. Lawrence of the New York Times and William Hines, Jr. of the Washington Star. Ted Koop, director of CBS News and Public Affairs in Washington, was your moderator today on Face the Nation. <laughs> Directors Robert Quinn, Washington, Charles Deppert, Indianapolis, Ted Marvel, New York City. Associated in production, Harriet Culley, Beryl Denzer, Nancy Honchman, Peter Masters, and Jack Benza. Produced and directed by Ted Ayers. Today on the CBS Public Affairs program, you saw through the eyes of this television camera, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin, face the nation. Next week's guest to face the nation will be Senator-elect Clifford P. Case, Republican of New Jersey and winner in one of 1954's closest campaign contests.